We are very grateful to the Most High God for the opportunity given to us to sit at his feet and receive directions from him. The topic I was given to write on, living a life of integrity as a Christian. Beloved, in Christ, we as Christians must be concerned about the level of corruption around us. We must be passionate about seeing the needed transformation we all desire. And I must say, since last August, when Chairman asked me to prepare this topic, my, my, so this morning, my mandate or assignment is to use scripture to help us scan through our lives as a mirror to see where we are as leaders of this great church and as concerned citizens of Ghana. Let's begin by reading Genesis chapter 27, verse 22. Genesis 27, 22 says that the voice is the voice of Jacob. But the hands are the hands of Esau. We see a father being deceived by his own son. But because he has taken some facilitation fee, he has eaten meat, which he demanded. His sense is being deceived and he's struggling. I pray that our voices will correlate with our hands. The words that comes out of our mouth will walk them. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 9 says, People with integrity will walk safely, but those who follow crooked paths will be exposed. Beloved in Christ, as we seek to possess the nation, one way the church can cause Christ glorifying societal transformation is to ensure that each member is living a life of integrity as a Christian. So this presentation will examine how the Christian life of integrity engages corruption, which seems to be an endemic societal canker. It seeks to raise some critical issues for consideration to help position the church and Christians as agents of transformation, especially in resistant corruption in our everyday lives to the glory of Christ. The paper will discuss themes including the dire need of Christians of integrity, the dynamics of corruption in society. We attempt to review the Old Testament and the New Testament perspectives on God's people and corruption. Integrity crisis in the church will be discussed. They will attempt to look at who the Christian is and then try to have a Christian concept of integrity and then maybe attempt to suggest some practical Christian approach to solving corruption. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. Beloved, in our attempt to engage and solve the corruption in our land, we must work hard to raise men who stand tall among their peers in times of crisis and difficulties and challenges. So we want to listen to things that were said concerning Noah. And this time around, I've chosen Job, my good friend, and Daniel. Genesis 6, 9b reads, Noah was a righteous man. The only blameless person living on the earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. All other people were messing up, but Noah was righteous, and he was blameless. Then there is this man whose righteousness and uprightness challenged God to the extent that God had to invite trouble for him. God, God knew he could stand. I'm talking about Job. Job 1.1. 1, 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, who feared God 
and turned away from evil. Then when Daniel's friends attempted to, as it were, find faults about him, this is what was said later. Daniel chapter 6, verse 3 to 5. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the governors of the provinces by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And thus, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, this man said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. For now, the scripture reading we want to consider is Acts 20, 33, when Paul met the leaders of the church in Ephesus and they said, I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. Can we stand tall as apostles, leaders of this great church, stand in front of our members and say, we have never coveted any, man, any person's money. We have never schemed. We've led this church with the integrity of our hearts. Can we? Dearly beloved, in this dark world of corruption, we need people who stand tall like the Noahs, the Job's, the Daniels, the Pauls, and others who are righteous, blameless, upright, trustworthy, not corrupt, not negligent, and not covetous. Our nation is crying for us. And they need us. Let's look at why the need for Christians of integrity. One of the most important aspects of human relationship is said to be the issue of integrity. We are living at a time when integrity has been violated through all kinds of scandals. One of the most important elements to our work with God is to be people of trustworthy so that the gospel that we preach will be accepted. When we speak, people should be able to look at our lives and see a correlation. But sad to say that even though the church exists, corruption is all over the place. As an engineer, I always want to use what engineers term structure integrity to explain integrity. In engineering, a structure such as a bridge or this building will be described as having structural integrity when it is sound and fits for purpose. This auditorium was designed so that we can set a receipt from the Lord. If there comes a term that we can use it for this purpose, it means it's lost its integrity. In the construction industry, structural integrity is something that is never taken for granted, no matter the cost. Because we know that if the structure loses its integrity, it will not be fit for purpose. So if a pastor, a pastor, a minister loses his integrity, it's not fit for purpose. For he's standing in the gap between human beings who are corrupt and God who he claims is righteous and is following. I will fit for purpose. In the same way, Christians must be people of integrity. That is, they should be sound, reliable, trustworthy, and should be described as dependable people. Our generation critically needs leaders with integrity. People who cannot be bought will not compromise with wrong, will walk the talk, and will be completely honest in small things, as in great things. But unfortunately, integrity seems to be a critical aspect of leadership 
which are mostly found wanting, both in the church and society as a whole. This is what informs Paul's admonition in choosing leaders for the church. I mean, he says, leaders must be above reproach. And such a leader, they are cast on your bear on aqua. No. We must be above reproach. There should be no skeletons in our cardboard. When they see us, they should see us as having met little Jesuses on the land. The integrity of the uprights guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 3. Beloved, it is clear corruption is an issue. But what do we do, or what do you consider as corruption? Is it all that we read in the news? Is it only about the obvious things that we see around, the large scale fraud? Is it only about the politicians? Is it about the civil servants? Is it about giving and receiving bribe? Is it only about misappropriation and misapplication? What about the moments of dishonesty or the so-called white lies we all see every day around it? Aren't they also corruption? Those lies. Our society and even our family values are sometimes shrouded in corruption. Our very upbringing, the foundations were very weak. A parent is traveling. The young boy is crying. He wants to follow the dad. Oh, where could I? I'm going to airplane, Abel. Don't cry. When I go to town, I buy an airplane. Meanwhile, the person doesn't even owe a bicycle tie. And he's going at the trotter station to pick a bus. But he can dare and tell the young man that, oh, don't cry. Our very upbringing has made some of us corrupt because we accept it as the status quo. Chairman, recently I spoke somewhere and my good friend Nana Ansasa Saku deterred the chief of Manfi, bemoaned this practice where we say, Yam fan sapain and cry him fear. And I said we should speak against these things. Because it's like whenever you want to approach a bigger man, as it were, a police person, at the back of our mind, because the person was sitting judgment, you don't go in sapain. You always must carry something. So even if somebody has mistreated you and want to report the case to a policeman or your boss, in fact, in Sapine and quite in fear. So every time you want to visit a big man, you don't go in Sapine. And then this one, opening in the form, to wait, elders do not make mistakes. So in our society, no matter what the leader does, it's correct. And therefore, it's breeding sycophancy. Oh, Papa, oh, Papa, everything, Papa, it is correct. But at the back of the people's mind, they know, oh, my baby. We need grace. Makuma no moon. Every day, one Thank you very much. When we were kids, we used to sit by the fireside. And the Kwakwanansi stories that were always told, always we credited the shrewd and the schemer, Anansi, to be the cleverest person. You always want to outwit people. So these were the stories. And the Kwakwanansi, yeah, yeah. So always the schemer was the hero. And then also, in some of the stories, we were told that the, the son in Tikuma sometimes also outwitted the father. So these were the stories that were shared around the fireside when we were kids. So when we're growing, scheming, don't tell the truth. A young man can beat the father if he's smart enough. 
It's time for us to change the narrative. It's time for us to change the narrative. Because this thing has become something that is, seems to be an accepted thing in our society. People who lie attempt to be smart guys. On delving deeper in discussing corruption, it becomes apparent that it is far more prevalent than we may choose to realize. Whether we like it or not, it's all over the place. And therefore, in this presentation, we want to look at corruption as the depravity of humanity. Nipa Sayawa say, the innate corruption of human nature. Bonimu Moral corruption and wickedness. For me, how can a drunkard impregnate an idol worshiper for him to become an apostle? It was just impossible. It would take grace. The man was drunk, and the woman was just coming from the fetish priest, and they met, and Kumilabi came. But thank God, we were fearfully and wonderfully made. So once we connect, he will redefine us. So it's time for us to redefine ourselves as Christians. So moral corruption and wickedness. If you read Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 32, if you get to your point, the Bible says people invent evil. People continue to invent sin. So we haven't seen anything yet. The society will continue to be corrupt, but it will take men of God like you and I to change the narrative. According to Vosta, corruption is the misuse of a public office or authority for private or personal gain. As a general secretary, when I'm taking decisions at the back of my mind, is it what I'll get? Some favors, some human applause, some monetary issues. If I do that, I'm corrupt. I lack integrity. Our society bedeviled with corrupt practices, including chronism, nepotism, over and under invoicing, wrongful and inappropriate acquisition of academic accolade for vain glory and acquisition of power. Apostle Chairman, permit me to share some few statements and frustration from three key personalities in our nation. The first, the IGP, who is a proud member of our church. And then the senior minister, Honorable Yao Asafo, and then the vice president, to buttress why they want to count on the church. This is a media report published on 8 January 2020 to the IGP, our brother, soon after he was confirmed, speaking at a national anti corruption action plan sensitization program for senior police officers. The IGP said internal regulatory mechanisms have been put in place in its time to reduce corruption within the service. And he continued to warn that the service will deal ruthlessly with personnel who engage in acts of corruption. And now the big issue, I quote him, may I mention here that for the first time in the history of Ghana Police Service, the Central Disciplinary Board of the Service has had no backlogs. Unlike the days where an officer could get involved in a situation and is either interdicted or suspended or his case is tended and the fire can be here for five to six years. But our brother says, this thing is a thing of the past. Once the issue comes, he deals with us. So the policemen should brace themselves for discipline. Then he continues, there is an adage that a fish starts rotting from the head. And therefore, it is appropriate to get our senior officers involved in the fight against corruption. Since we are the head, we have no choice but to work very hard to address the perception of corruption. If we are to remain relevant as a law enforcement institution in the country. And I can assure you that the police institution is resolved to see this through. This is our member making this statement. What is the church leaders resolving to do? Knowing that everything starts from the head. And our brother is 
saying he wants to do something about it. Then the senior minister also delivered a message during the just under 71st New Year School, and that's what he said. He said the country loses so much to corruption as a result of inflated costs of projects, particularly in the public sector, adding that a renewed mindset, this they can do. I've sat in meetings with him, and he admits this they can do, except the church. Adding that a renewed mindset will trigger attitudinal change. Thus, laws can do. Thus, the judiciary can do. By ensuring that citizens become patriotic, honest, and disciplined. And then inside this, we have sent them documents. And he quotes from what he got from the document churches have submitted to him. He said, in the educational process, you need classroom blocks, but there are cost disparities. The nations that says, and the churches do this, and there is a vast difference in the cost. Anytime you compare expenses incurred at the public sector windows with that from the churches, ours is unacceptable. Then I ask myself, are they not working with Christians? Are they not working with Christians? And he conclude by saying, therefore, a lot of money goes waste through the public sector. Finally, the vice president says that his government, since 2017, they have tried to work on corruption. One is to work on the legal framework. The other, strengthen the institutions to fight corruption. And third, put systems in place to prevent corruption. And this is what worries me. He says that, the operational budget of CHAC, for example, has been increased from 1.8 million cities to 5 million within three years. And then for SRAG, it has been increased from 1.8 to 12 million just to solve corruption. You have to find more money. Brothers and sisters, our leaders, both the government and the opposition, when we meet, they tell us their good intentions toward the development of the nation. But the multi-million dollar question is, why are we in the mess? The church holds the key. The church is the answer. All we need are integral leaders. Let me unequivocally inform you that both the governments and opposition are knocking at our doors for the church to open up and come and help them. They are pleading that we should come over to Macedonia. So let's brace ourselves up. We are the true prophets of the land. And we dare not lose our prophetic stance. My brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, despite the huge presence of churches in Africa, in especially West Africa, the 2018 Corruption Perception Index published by Transparency International, Ghana and Burkina Faso tied at position 78 out of 180 nations. With all the churches, we are competing with Burkina Faso at position 78 out of 180. According to the Ghana Integrity Initiative Consortium, the following could be described as corruption, bribery, embezzlement, fraud, favoritism, extortion, illegal contribution, nepotism, conflict of interest, and then the abuse of discretion, and payment of facilitation fees. Once as a general secretary, a year after I've resumed office, there's this young man that we have adopted and uh, were, were taking care of him. Then there is this purse, Pentecost Educational Scholarship team. I sat in chair and I realized, oh, this young man was at UCC. Maybe so let me give him some scholarship. I wrote him a letter. He brought all the documents. Pastor A.B. and his people work on it. He went to find everything. The letter came through. Then, after one devotion at home, I discussed with my wife. 
And we said, when we were adopting the young man, way back in 2011, at Michelle Camp, we didn't know we become general secretary. So it wasn't because we were going to become general secretary, that's why we adopted him. So we can't use church money. Because my position, I dare not abuse their discretion. There was a attempt. I called a young man. He brought the letter. We shredded it. And thank God, God has been faithful. He's now in Germany doing his master's. God can do it. So abuse of discretion is a form of corruption. And then payment of facilitation fees. All this information are very disturbing. And it's a wake-up call for the church of God, and especially we, the leaders of the church, to demonstrate our prophetic role. Salt of the earth and light of the world. Small corruption leads to big corruption. And we all agree that what we call small corruption are without a doubt all over the place. But the Bible says righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any nation. This is a simple rule. Either we choose the path of righteousness so that our nation will develop or we all sit back and indulge in the corrupt practices and then bring shame and disgrace to our nation. There is no middle way. Either we are here or we are there. One of my uncles recently just said, that's Kofi Otutulabi, a prolific writer and a retired banker said, integrity is a virtue most needed in our country. Just imagine the quality of roads we will have to cite only one example. If all involved in road works applied integrity and use the requisite standards in the execution of projects, how long will our roads last? And I know as an engineer that if you do the normal sapit and what is in our yard here, it should be able to take us for six years, between six and eight years. And then if you do the asphalt, it should be able to take you around 20 years. But in Ghana, we do roads three months. Your guess is as good as mine. And my uncle says that your life of integrity will save you when falsely accused. And there are rewards, and those rewards can be generational. So if you live a life of integrity, you'll be sure that the generations that will come after you will come and enjoy the fruits of that. Integrity crisis in the church. Beloved Christians are expected to be upright and whole without a stain of corruption and vile. Warren Buffett says, look for three things in a person. Integrity and intelligence, energy, and integrity. If they don't have the last one, don't even bother with the first two. And in Ghana, we have intelligent people, very smart, knowledgeable, but some letters after their names. Some even have two PhDs and professors and all that. And we are a very hardworking nation. Look at the time our mothers wake up. Four years, they're already on the tracks. They come home around 12 in the night. But what about the third one? We are where we are because we are using our minds, not our hearts. And Warren Buffett is saying that people who are intelligent and are full of strength will always corrupt the system, not until they work with a heart of integrity. I can say Acts 7.29. It's one of my favorite quotations in the whole Bible. See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Oh, the far, not the far. Oh, Titan, no Lucia. Oh, Celia, no Obamina. That's why we are struggling. The very people who sit in council to enact law, soon after that, they meet somewhere to see how best they can outweigh the system. That is human nature. But that could not, cannot be said about the church. You and I are ministers of the gospel. We claim to have been saved from darkness into a marvelous light. 
We can't live double standards. We can never be schemers. Straightforward, because God made us upright. The devil who corrupted our inner being. But thank God, the Bible says, if somebody is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old has passed. And everything, everything has become new. And we know schemers circumvent policies, rules, and regulations. Scheming only results in more obsession, delusion, frustration, and dissatisfaction. But God upholds schemers in his vineyard. He is a sovereign God who sees all things and has power to break every scheme of men. That frustrates his counsel for the church and his people. We must not be obsessed with material things such as power, wealth, honor, vehicles, food, and all that. Scheming is a sign of covetousness. And godliness with contentment is great gain. We can talk about how we run the ministries, how we put reports together. Are the figures right? Do we pay all designated monies in full to appropriate quarters? Do we massage figures to please our bosses? How transparent are we with our wives? Even some we are told when the farewell money comes, their wives don't see it. They don't know their paycheck. They don't know whether they enjoy educational bonus. They don't know anything. Sometimes they have to even beg for money for collection. And they call themselves ministers of the gospel. How transparent are we? Do our family members see Christ in us? Are we people of integrity? Matt Magani has said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. He has said about somebody by name Christ. He has read about him. And he knows that man to be a good man. Some people call themselves Christian, but the two doesn't match. Their voices and their hands don't correlate. So this man says, oh, people, you are disturbing us. For your Christ, no problem. But for you, I have a problem. Then let's zoom to a family that had serious challenges. A family full of hypocrisy, dishonesty, and duplicity. A family that lacked integrity. Mr. Isaac, Mrs. Rebecca Isaac, young man Jacob Isaac, and Esau Isaac. Because their father's name is Isaac. So I'll give them that same name. Right from that story, we see Isaac holding a secret meeting with Esau. Isaac holding a secret meeting with Esau. And then Rebekah suspecting the father. So the wife is spying on the father while she was having a closed-door meeting with her son. Why would he do that? Because this young woman had prayed to God, and God had told him that there were two nations in her belly. And the older one was going to serve the younger man. Rebecca suspects the man. Now Isaac, the father, tells Esau, facilitate me before I bless you. The man was ready to bless, but he wanted to chop meat. Food is for the belly. But the Bible says that King James of God will disrupt both it and them. So the man wants to be facilitated as leaders. Do we take facilitation fee? Directly or indirectly? When appointing a ministry leader, when putting up a committee to put your farewell retirement package together, have those that you are putting together ever facilitated you? Are they the people who do your bidding? So, Father Isaac sits in chair and he wants to be facilitated. Then Madame Rebecca said, Oba facilitate, Namine the Obere. Then she said, No, Minimini, I'm a Deba Mano. So, scheming all over. A wife and a son plots against the father and another son. So, they were able to deceive this man to take the blessings. And later, the story tells us there was 
animosity between the brothers. There was a whole confusion in the family, separation and all that. But the striking statement Isaac made is what I want us to reflect. The man was struggling. Genesis 27, 22 to 24. Jacob went close to the, his father. Then the blind old man touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob. But the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him. For his sons were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. You see, he proceeded to, then after the blessing, the Bible says, are you really my son Esau? His eyes were bled. The Bible said, bribe, bless people's eye and judgment. This should serve as a check on us as Christians. As leaders, do we expect gifts before doing what is expected of us? Honesty said, it's a very expensive gift. Don't expect it from cheap people. That's from Warren Buffett. Let's live above reproach. Let's not be people who are hypocrites, pretending to be what we are not. If you read Hosea chapter 4, verse 7 to 9, it talks about religious hypocrisy. The more priests there were, the more they sinned against me. How come? The more churches we are, the more corrupt the nation becomes. They exchange their glorious God for something disgraceful. They feed on the sins of my people and relish their wickedness. And it will be like people, like priests. I'll punish both of them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. Beloved, some critical issues for our consideration. The preacher in his message, Ezra chapter 7 verse 10 says, For Ezra had set aside to study the law of the Lord and do it and teach us. Let's not prepare a message for the members. Let's prepare the message first for ourselves. Live in them. And even if we don't preach it, they will look at us. They will look at us and live right. James Baden, I said, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. James Baden, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. We preach simplicity, but how simple are we? We preach contentment, but how content are we? How many vehicles do we want to retire with? How many buildings do you want to put up before you retire? How much money do you want to have in your account and investment whilst many are dying? And people can't pay their children's school fees. The very members who raise the offerings for us, they can't cater for themselves. But still, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. And IGP says, anything that rots starts from the head. Then the abuse of power, relationship, and authority, you can read from Matthew chapter 20, 20 to 28, where Salome and her sons, James and John, goes to corner Jesus and say, Master, we have come. Promise us that whatever we ask you do. Jesus said, oh, oh, and say Salome, because she was... She was her auntie. He said, when you sit in your kingdom, I want James to be the ben and then John to be the Nephine. They were sharing the kingdom authority here on earth. Meanwhile, there were 12. Why were they able to do that connection? Are we not abusing the relationship? As a church, are we practicing chronism, nepotism, and favoritism? Therefore, let's do this and that. Bible says when they did that, there was indignation in the others. The other ten couldn't contend with it. And Jesus said, the rulers of this earth lord their position on them, but that should not be said of us. Do we look into people's faces 
before we give them appointments. Our society says that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. When man is authorized a certain amount of power, the temptation and tendency has always been to abuse that power or authority in favor of selfish gain. Money, influence, prestige, control. We preach forgiveness. But sometimes when you are in authority and somebody offends you, how will you handle it? Chairman, some critical issues I can't explain but just to mention and run down the presentation. Other critical areas for our consideration. Immorality. Handling of the opposite sex. Misappropriation of church funds. Testimonies given during farewell retirement services. Are they all true? But they have to tell us so that we can laugh. But they know. They are telling us what will please us. I don't know. But can't we stop it? I don't know. Implementation of the review ministerial welfare practices, joint farewells, transfers, and visitations. Do we really select the right people? How do we handle fuel and vehicle maintenance? Maybe one day, people, when they retire, can't we use what Jesus said? Well done, good and faithful servant, period. But we have to struggle and write excellent. Because Mr. A was given excellent, and another person should also have excellent. We read Ezra chapter 8, verse 24 to 33. Ezra tells the priest, you are holy. These articles too are holy. Carry them. When we get to the other side, I'll call you to come and run the accounts by number and by weight. The value and the weight must be the same. If we are men of integrity. When money is given to us, we should see ourselves as holy people managing holy resources in the church. Proverbs 20, 33 says, Unequal weights are abomination to the Lord. And false skills are not good. So, if we are like this, we should balance it with this. Otherwise, we are lacking integrity. The concept of Christian integrity. Beloved, I want to state that integrity is a mark of true repentance because it's the opposite of corruption. We were sinners. We met Christ. He pardoned us, he washed us, he justified us, and sanctified us. Therefore, we should walk in the path of righteousness. That is all. So our conduct as children and representatives of God must be in integrity, truthfulness, and honesty. Consistent integrity is essential for the people who claim Christ as their Lord. Integrity produces honor, truth, Reliability. It deepens relationships and develops the confidence of others in you and Christianity. When people speak against the church because of a minister, it affects all of us. So people are becoming disillusioned because leaders don't walk the talk. So the question is, are we leading the church with the integrity of our hearts? Integrity. See, as faithful believers means practicing godly character ahead of our ambition without any excuse. I want to define or reflect on the following as forms of integrity or ways of defining integrity. Maintaining a consistent lifestyle, whether people are watching or not. This thing I'm doing now, if it comes to light, will it glorify God? Or I'll be disgraced. This thing, even if my wife hears of it, will she be happy and commend me? Or she will feel ashamed. Maintain a pure conscience before God and man. 
So if you say you are righteous and you are a person of integrity, I want you to work it. Whatever you say, I want to see you practice it. Otherwise, per Bible standard, you've lost it. Having pure motives, you know, that we do. At the back of our minds, why are we doing A, B, C, D? Ask yourself. Reflect. Are you transparent? Are you genuine? Are you comfortable with what you are doing? I've said to people that I like the account rendering of Kenshin's. Kenshin's in account is Utibwa. I like the syllable. There is an animal in our head. That is Utimwa Bwa. When you do something wrong, evil, and you are even acquitted and discharged, when you go to bed, this animal will bite. I like the rendering of Utibwa, the animal in your head. Don't let us lose our conscience. We should have pure motives in all we do. Like someone we should be able to stand up. My hands are clean for the people to respond. Yes, God is our witness. His hands are clean. Living above reproach. Living as if you were on live TV global. I know people are watching us on Pen TV and on Facebook live. So I know all that I've said here. If the IGP hears it, it is on PCFM website. I've not lied. If the vice president hears it, he said it. I heard it on radio and I've read it. Senior minister hears it. He has told me in person. I was there. And he said, wait there. Yeah, just a sorry in the bay. If my friend, Honorable Yosafu Match is watching or hears, you know, so this should be people of integrity, living as if you were on live television global. Beloved, if God was to screen our minds and the thoughts here are being shown here, hey, what will happen here? What will happen here? Even the bitterness, the anger, the frustration, the animosity, the scheming. Integrity is having no skeletons in our cupboard. As I ran through, I met Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 5, 1 to 19, you can read later. When he came to position or he came to be the governor, Bible says he came to meet a great art crowd. The people were in abject poverty. Corruption was all over the place. If you get to verse, he said, we, our sons and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. They were mortgaging their farmlands and their children for food. But the Bible says that when Nehemiah came to the scene, he was angry. Sometimes as Christians, we must be angry to change the status quo. I've said to people that when Jesus entered the temple and there was corruption, he turned the tables around. Let's begin turning tables around. Right from executive level, apostles are receiving. Let's turn tables around so that we can turn things in out, inside out, for God's will to manifest in the land and in the church. So Nehemiah, get to verse 5, says, we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. Then I was very angry when I heard it. And then what did he do? He decided that, let me read the verse 14 to 19. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 12th year to the 32nd year of Atasas the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowances of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burden on the people and took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. They took money from them and gave it to them, the governors, as allowances. Meanwhile, the people were mortgaging their lands. Even their servant lorded it over the people. Bats, bats, bats. I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work, in the ministry. And we acquired no land. And all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were about 150 men. So he did not take advantage or do advantage of the poor and the weak. 
He did not want to take more money from them because the people were distressed. He wanted to relieve them. So even things that he was due for, he didn't take. And he said he didn't use his position as the mayor of the land even to acquire more land. He and the servants. But why is it that everywhere you go, you want to have a land? Because the people want to help you to have a land. Yet, for I did all this. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was serving on these people. And then he prayed, Remember me, O God, my God, all that I have done for these people because of his motive to serve a, the living God. He did not walk the path that his forebear walked. Then we meet an epitome of integrity, Uriah, 2 Samuel chapter 11. David didn't go to war, and then he commits adultery, and then Bathsheba becomes pregnant. Then he calls this man home, come and give report. After Uriah giving the report, he says, now go home and wash your feet. But Bible says, Uriah did not go, he slept on the veranda. The next day, the man made him drunk and forced him to go. And then when we get to verse 11, it says, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants, my Lord, are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? Then he looks straight in his eyes. As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Standing before your boss, forcing you to falsify issues. We find instances where leaders have connived with, either apostles have connived with pastors to do things on toward. Area the kings agree with pastors not to pay all. Wow. We need men who will be courageous enough and tell the apostles, for the sake of God and my conscience and my salvation, I will never be a sycophant. Look at them straight and tell them. If they sign to you, God is your provider. And God will be your protector. He will order the steps, your steps. He will provide your needs. As my wife will always say, truth is one. Say it. Everybody will hate you, but at the back of their mind, they know you are the truthful person. And for Uriah, he won't do that. And then the last bit. The king becomes frustrated that he's tendered his own warrant to him. Why was David bold enough to write a letter and give to Uriah? He trusted the person. He knew Uriah was an army officer, army general, all right. So if he happens to open it and sees that he has written his death warrant, he will turn the gun on him. But between David and Uriah, David trusted this man so much that as for Uriah, even if I say he should die, he will die. So he's, he writes his death warrant, seals it. And the Bible says in it, it's been written that send you to where the, 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 the battle is fierce, withdraw the troops and let him die. But this man carries it and goes and hands it over. He doesn't know. Job opens the letter send him to the hottest and the fiercest point, and Uriah fights. He realized that the others were retreating. He didn't ask questions. And he died as a person of integrity. Beloved, how many of us, how many of us will be faithful enough if your area gives you appraisal forms and say, take it and give it to Jesus straight May the good Lord help us. If we all yearn and desire and are burdened and passionate enough to see the ills and the corruption in our land reversed, it starts with us. Once we become men of integrity, once we live our lives as Christians of integrity and leaders who want to worship the good Lord in truth, Honesty, selflessness. The good Lord will give us grace to be able to change the ills in the land. Chairman, the others, I crave your indulgence to end here and encourage my colleagues to read and learn some lessons from it. May the good Lord 
Have mercy on us.